Coming up, a New York congressman attacked. He's a candidate for governor too. The weapon the attacker carried and who stepped in to stop him coming up next. Another day in the 90s when the heat wave finally ends. And time to get real. Is your rent too high? Well, if you live in the city, the answer is probably yes. We're looking into why some rent relief isn't coming anytime soon. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back. I'm Kay Ingram, and this is News for Now for July 22nd. Now, first up, let's talk politics because New York Governor Kathy Hochul is condemning an attack on her opponent in the race for governor. Republican candidate Lee Zeldin was attacked during one of his campaign stops. Zeldin was speaking at VFW Post in Fairport, southeast of Rochester, when his campaign says a man tried to stab him. Video shows a man wearing some sort of blades on his hand, jump on the trailer, yelling, you're done. Zeldin grabs the man's wrist and they fall. People in the audience grabbed the man and took his weapon. He's been identified as 43-year-old David Jacobonis. No word yet on charges. And Zeldin continued speaking after the commotion happened. Following the attack, a Zeldin spokesperson issued a statement saying, far more must be done to make New York safe again. Hip-hop artist Fetty Luciano is facing charges in connection with a pool party shooting at the Mansion Hotel on Long Island. In this case, the party was July 10th at the Glen Cove property. Police arrested the Brooklyn artist, whose real name is Remy Marshall. He's being charged with attempted murder and weapons charges. The shooting happened during what was billed as a celebrity birthday party, attended by at least 150 people. Three people were hurt in the shooting. The city of Glen Cove says that the party was not allowed, and Mansion's liquor license has been suspended. All right, up next, here in the Tri-State, we've been talking a lot about shark attacks, and the latest is a 16-year-old who was bit while surfing except he tells us he feels pretty lucky that it wasn't a lot worse. Max Haynes' foot was still wrapped and hurting as he spoke with reporters from his porch Thursday. He's the fifth shark attack victim off Long Island in less than a month. Haynes had been out surfing with his friend in the water off Kismet Beach on Fire Island on Wednesday. He says that the recent shark incidents were a topic of banter with his buddy until the joke became real. Haynes says he never saw the shark, but felt its presence. His father, who is an EMT, was watching from the shore and helped him control the bleeding. So far, though, none of the shark victims have been seriously hurt. Up next, Rockland County officials have reported the very first case of naturally occurring polio here in the U.S. since 1979. Officials are not giving out specific information about where the person who caught the virus lives. The health department did tell us, though, that the patient is an adult who was not vaccinated and is no longer contagious. If you're not vaccinated against polio, there's a clinic this weekend at the Pomona Health Complex. The information is on your screen right now. You can make an appointment by calling the number you see there, 845-238-1956. We're told that walk-ins are also welcome. Hey, I'm meteorologist Matt Brickman. You know, this week the big story has been the heat. We've been so focused on how hot it's been in the city and, you know, rightly so, right? It's been in the 90s, three straight days, back to back days of heat waves. But look at Newark. They've just notched two days at 100 degrees and they have seen an incredibly hot July so far. 14 days in the 90s. There's only been 21 days, so two of every three days have been in the 90s this month, already passing their average for the month and their total from last year. We've had seven days in the 90s by comparison in New York City, but we'll add to that total in both spots today and right through the weekend with highs actually getting warmer up until Sunday where we could set record highs in the city and in Newark. One final day in the 90s on Monday and then thankfully that heat wave comes to an end. Uh, okay, don't hate me, but I know this one is going to hit home for a lot of us. Rent. Why is it that rent is so high? I mean, it's not like we can do anything about it, but still, why? Well, NBCLX is here to look at why it is and also why the signs of it slowing down aren't happening anytime soon. Check it out. Prices could ease up is Zillow senior economist Jeff Tucker. Jeff, all right, looking ahead to the next couple of months, how bad are prices going to get or are they going to get a little better? 
Unfortunately, no. I don't have a lot of great news in that respect. We don't expect rents to be coming plummeting back down anytime soon. Um, you know, rents, our national rent index is up about 16% year over year. So that's, that's much higher than the BLS captures in the actual like official inflation numbers. And one of the reasons for that is so many folks kind of coming back to the city. And you mentioned New York City and Manhattan really stands out in this respect where rents are up over a third in the last year. So our rent index for Manhattan just jumped from $3,000 to $4,000 in a single year. And I think that trend of cities reopening jobs and offices kind of reopening and pulling people back in is actually just picking up steam at this point. Wow. And the one other huge factor affecting the rental market, oddly enough, is mortgage rates. Mortgage rates have about doubled from this time last year, from under 3% to over 5%. That means some of those renters who were going to move out, vacate their unit and buy their first home are instead staying put and renewing that lease. So that adds to the pressure on the rental market. It certainly does. And many renters, you know, having to possibly move or even downsize because they can no longer afford their rent. In fact, I want to listen to a teacher from Austin, Texas, real quick on how rent prices have impacted her and then talk to you on the other side. If I had signed the lease, I would have, it would be taking a lot of my savings. Um, and so I decided to move uh, to a new building. I'm losing about 150 square feet. Here's the real question. What is the most that a land uh, landlord can actually raise rent? And I have a feeling it's going to vary state by state. Yeah, in a lot of the country, it's just what the market will bear. They, oh, they can wow. basically raise rent to whatever they think would make them the most money. Um, but in other cities, you know, uh, New York City and Los Angeles, a lot of the biggest cities actually in the U.S. do have some form of rent control. It's you, you should really research whether it applies to your unit and your building. It's often mostly applied to older buildings, um, which are sort of, uh, you know, set earlier. So it's kind of tied to the overall rate of inflation. So e even in rent controlled places, your rent is still probably going up this year, just at a somewhat lower pace. Okay, let's go back to New York and talk about uh, talk about New York because that was kind of the most shocking statistic, at least from my perspective. And New York is such a tricky market. Residents, they're paying a lot of money for just a little bit of space. I actually lived there for a summer, so I can tell you it was tough. But only 23% of New Yorkers can afford to pay the average cost of the rent in the city. So why is rent so high there? And what could this mean if rent prices end up pushing residents out of the city? Yeah, I, you know, New York City is the center of it all. It's it's a place where people want to move. It's got some of the highest paid employers in the country. And so when you hear only 23% of people can afford the rent, that's really kind of based on the market rent. Like what are the current openings going for? Right. Uh, which goes to show you that for a lot of those residents, especially if they're in some of those rent controlled units, if they get forced out one way or the other and forced out onto that open market, they are basically going to have to move away. They couldn't actually go back and sign a new lease at today's going rates. So that is incredibly disruptive. You know, for a family with kids, they may have to move schools if they move out and they can't afford to sign on an apartment in the same school district. Um, this is a major affordability crisis in this country. And, you know, frankly, at, at the moment, it's not very clear what federal policymakers can do about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think in the long run, what we need is more housing. You know, we need to go from a, a mindset and a level of scarce housing to fairly abundant housing. But in the short term, you know, in, in Manhattan, there's only about half as many vacant units as there were a year ago that are listed for rent right now. Oh, wow. So at the moment, uh, we are in this extreme scarcity mindset. And that means it's sort of like a game of musical chairs. More and more residents are finding themselves without a seat and they've just got to go somewhere else. Right, especially because in New York, you know, it's such a, a diverse population of people doing all sorts of things. I mean, if rent is that high, if you're someone, for instance, in the service industry, it's going to be very difficult sometimes for you to find a place to live. So Jeff Tucker, thank you so much for coming on and going over these numbers with us. Thanks for having me on. All right, well, that's it for today's show. I'm going to head back inside. Stay cool out there, and I'll see you back here next week on News for Now. See you guys.